For today's video, I even drug out some really old files going as far back as the Canon 10D, which was my first serious digital camera. And that was right in that transition period where digital really started to take over in 2007, 8, 9. I want to talk to you today about exposure or more specifically about ETTR or expose to the right. Now this comes up quite a bit. If you've been doing photography for long, I'm sure you've been told by people, oh, I always just ETTR it, right? I expose to the right. I'm going to give you the crux of this up front just to lay it out there. You don't need to expose to the right because it's not 2005 anymore. The cameras, when you lift the shadows now, don't completely fall apart. They have an immense amount of dynamic range most of the time. And even when the sensors were worse, Oftentimes, digital actually pulled us into a trap of lifting the shadows too much because we could do it so much and it was exciting. But actually, those deep shadows are often what give us the drama. And when we expose to the right, at some point, we're inevitab inevitably going to either clip or near clip. And even near clipping can cause a reduction in tone in the highlights, just like lifting shadows can cause some reduction in tone in the shadows. So the best thing is to expose correctly. Expose right, not to the right. But now I'm going to show you why, and we're going to look at examples, including some old files to really nail down why I think exposed to the right became gospel for some photographers. Taking great photos is about visualizing and creating, knowing shadow, how to hack those shadows, how to use light. And so if you like a particular technique and it works for you, that's fine. But today I want to explain why exposed to the right is actually kind of wrong. I'm going to start by going back to some older files here. I want to start with these three at the top. And the reason is that these are files from a Canon 30D. So these were taken around the 2008 range, right? We were getting a little bit past the 10D. The sensors were getting a little better, but still shooting at like 8 megapixels on this 30D. A huge leap was around the 5D Mark II generation when things really started to increase in resolution and quality. These early cameras really struggled with long exposures. They struggled with shadows. They struggled with dynamic ranges. And I think one of the reasons that exposed to the right became a thing is because early digital cameras had limited dynamic range and people found that it was useful because they were afraid, oh, if I'm darker, then I have to bring up my shadows or bring up my exposures and I'm going to introduce noise. And if I'm lighter and I just have to push down, it doesn't introduce noise because I'm going darker. And the problem is, while that's partly true, if you're lighter and pushing down, you are losing something as well. Now, here's a relatively simple scene taken looking over Moses Lake, okay? And so here is my middle exposure. This is back in the days when I was doing a lot of HDR and the bracketing type before our sensors improved and our software improved. And I really started realizing, hey, we can do great HDR with a single file and products like natural HDR presets came to be. But this is a bracketed HDR, which I rarely need to do with today's sensors, but there could be a time for it. So here's a minus two, right? Here's the, the middle exposure and here's a plus two. Now, Let's take these, first of all, and equalize all of them. I'm just going to use Quick Develop. So I'm going to select the minus two, and I change the file names just to make it clear what we're looking at, because in a second, they're going to look the same. I'm going to go over here in Lightroom, and I'm going to go up two stops on exposure on the dark one. Then I'm going to leave the middle alone, and I'm going to take the plus two, and I'm going to go down two stops. Now, what you're going to see as we do this is the middle one has been left alone. So here is zero. Here is pushed up two stops, and I know nothing changed because they look exactly the same, and this was a lighter exposure. Now you notice the lighter exposure that we pushed down does look a lot different. And why is that? Because when you push your highlights far, even though we are recovering these highlights, and they're not technically clipped, although some of these areas in here, it looks to me like we're true clipping, right? But that said, the overall exposure is the same, but we lack tone definition. Look at the sky here, 
versus the overexposure. Everything else in the scene looks about the same except where our highlights were pushing to the edge. Let's reset this and you can see that we're really pushing those highlights up into the clipping area. And if we turn on clipping indicators, we have a little bit of true clipping. Sure, we can pull down and we can use techniques and we can use highlight and shadow and all that, but there is a loss. Now, an exposed to the right fan would immediately say to me, well, you don't expose to the right till you clip, you expose to the right, just right to the edge of clipping indicators on your camera, or you use zebras on your camera, even a little bit more accurate, because you can define the limit and say, hey, when I'm at 90% white, start turning those zebras on. And this is a function in most cameras. If you're overexposing, you obviously don't want to push into pure white clipping, because once you pass 255 on your pixel of your sensor, there's no recovering that information. There's only painting over it and trying to restore those details. And there are ways to do that. And there's a video, I'll link the video on restoring truly destroyed highlights manually in here because sometimes you need to, even on these modern sensors we have. While yes, this is two stops over, so we clipped a little bit, even in the areas that aren't two stops over, we're losing tonal definition. Let's come back and look real quick. So here is our mid exposure. And here is this. Obviously, we have a little bit of clipping right here in these areas that needs some work. But honestly, across the whole sky, even though we've evened out this exposure to be the same, we have more color richness. Because as we're pushing those pixels to their max and overexposing them, we're going to affect the tone. Now, the argument for exposing to the right is this. If I say, hey, I'm going to bring this middle exposure up one stop. I want it a little lighter. And, and then I want to do some shadow recovery, right? Let's bring some shadows back. I don't really need this many shadows. A common mistake, and I talk about this a lot as we talk about shadow hacking, is that we're always trying to recover all the shadows when shadows are actually what our photos need. That's a topic for another video or for one of my workshops, but let's look at the shadows here. Remember, these are early cameras, and back then we were on Lightroom version two, I think it was. So look at how it handled the shadows of this versus the current Lightroom version five. You would see similar results in capture one, in on one, things like that. Our processing has got a lot better, but these sensors were rough. We're gonna put this at zero exposure, leave the exposure at zero, but I'm gonna recover a bunch of shadows, right? Kind of do an HDR, a bad HDR. I could do it better, but just to illustrate. Even in this, we're getting quite a bit of noise as we recover these shadows. I'm gonna put shadow recovery at about 70 points, right? So we're getting detail in the shadow, but there's still shadow. Now let's go back to this darker one. This one has been brought up two stops to make it look the same. And let's do that same 70 point shadow recovery. Here's the deal. If you look at compare, you can clearly see when I zoom in. Now bear in mind, I'm zooming in 200% on these to illustrate because these were eight megapixel files. There is a vastly larger amount of noise on the left here and on the right. Now we could do noise reduction, we could do color noise reduction, but we're trying to bring the same amount of detail. Obviously the one that is two stops underexposed, we're bringing noise into those shadows. Now, arguably, we shouldn't be exposing to the right two stops. You should kind of plan your exposed to the right based on your situation. But then again, if you're planning your exposure anyways, why not do it correctly? Here's another 30D raw file taken at sunset in pretty harsh lighting conditions. And you can see that if we crank up the exposure to bring detail into this, you bet we get a lot of noise. These were early digital cameras. If I take something practical like HDR Miscape to give this a good process, and then even push my shadows a little more. I don't want this. I don't need that. It doesn't look good anyway. I want shadow. I just don't want it to be completely blocked up. So I can bring just a little bit of texture into it and it's not gonna put too much noise into it, even on this very old file. Now, I want us to contrast that to a middle generation file. Here is where we came to the 5D Mark II generation is this file taken here in the subway. Let's do a very similar thing. Let's put some kind of an HDR. I'm just a natural HDR. I'm gonna put HDR Earthscape on it, right? So here is our raw file. Here's a little processing with HDR Earthscape. And I still have quite a bit of black, but that's not bad. Look, I'm not actually clipping. Look at my histogram right here. What does that mean? I'm right down there at about zone one. And zone one, you can actually compare the zones. We don't have time to get into zones on today's video, but if you look at zones in relation to a histogram, 
they can line right in with your histogram and you can use your zone scale to place exposures wherever you want. And you can do that, and I'll come back to it, with just how you meter. Let's go back to this 5D Mark II file, and you can see that if I did want to pull out information, I could lift the shadows more, and these are falling apart way less. Obviously, you're going to get some noise if you push the shadows, but I'm pushing those shadows too far. If I have that much lift in the shadows, I'm taking away that rich shadow that I want. And I could also noise reduce this. So you're seeing that this image here, if I pull back highlights, if I lift shadows, and if I kind of combine everything around, I get a balance that is much better. Now, that goes even farther in even more modern cameras. Here is an A7R Mark two file. Now even this sensor is like five, six, is it seven years old now? And if you look at the raw file of this, you can see I had huge dynamic range. If I had pushed this to the right to bring more into my shadows, I would have clipped it even more. I exposed this for zones to properly expose for zones and get an image that was a little bit flat, but very controllable. Look at what I get out of this after applying natural HDR presets, some gradients, right? I'm still clipping a little bit. And to finish this image in one file, I actually do need to pull back a little more in this sky with some manual brushing, which I did in the final version. But look at the level of dynamic range we have from our pure shadows in this generation of camera with very little noise, even though we lift our shadows up all the way to this extreme highlights in the sky. The difference between this and our 20D, 30D generation cameras is absolutely astounding. And the latest version of this full frame sensor, of course, is even more. Okay, Gavin, obviously the sensors are better now, but exposed to the right still lets me push up the shadows so that in post, I just drop it down and I don't get those noise in the shadows. My question for most photos would be why you want to push up the shadows that much anyway. If, if you're exposing in a, in a good middle range in your histogram, putting things, your main subject where you want it with your zones, why would you want to lift your shadows so much that they had a lot of noise? Most of the time, you're just losing your shadows at that point, and most of the great photos have shadows. This is something I've been talking about a lot on the channel and in my workshops. And if you specifically want to dig into this more, go check out my Shadow Hacker workshop over on my site. I'll put a link down below because I've been doing live workshops with you guys to explain the secrets of hacking shadows and how this all combines with these exposure techniques. The bottom line is that you don't actually get that much back by overexposing. And when you overexpose, you do risk not only clipping your highlights, but actually losing nuance of tone like we showed. Even the areas that weren't clipped, the color and the detail and the tone of those highlights was still not nearly as rich. It doesn't mean that you have to do what the camera tells you. You can take an in-camera meter, or you can take a spot meter like this one, or you can take a classic meter like the Seaconic, and you can be doing spot metering, reflective metering. If, if you really want to get precise, you take and you do a spot meter with something like the Seaconic 508 or you take a Pentex digital spot meter like this one right here, and you point and you spot meter exactly. And once you do that, you can place your, ob your subject in whatever zone you want, light or dark, because cameras don't know the right exposure. You need to know the exposure for you. That's something we get into more in other workshops and in things like Exposed. But the bottom line is, when you expose to the right, you're intentionally saying, I know what I want my exposure to be in my mind, now I'm gonna overexpose it. Now you have a photo that isn't ready to use out of camera, you're always going to have to manipulate, and at some point you're going to overclip it, or at the very least, you're going to lose highlight tone. If you look at histograms, and how they give us information. If you look at old files, like this old 10D file, one of my earliest long exposures, 62 seconds, full of noise, horrible compared to today's cameras. Another 10D photo, look at the limitation of dynamic range that we have on these compared to now. But when you're exposing to the right, and 
and or getting to the point where you clip those highlights, there's no truly recovering those unless you paint in those details. Let's take this portrait here done with a fill strobe in the front with a difficult white shirt and a lot of shadow in the background. The thing is, I can still go to something like natural HDR presets. I could manually edit, or I could just use something like night strobe and a slight exposure augmentation and have all of this range looking really good. Do I have lots of shadows? Yes, but that's actually what's allowing my subject to really separate, the lines of that tree to really separate. And I could say, look, I, I still have some, some white in the shirt. I could even drop that down more with a mask or even take a shortcut and use something like an elegance mask. And let's just do a highlight burn mask from elegance and bring those shadows down even more. Now I have this even more balanced dynamic range and I could lift up the shadows if I wanted to, to make it even more, but I actually like the shadows here. If I had pushed this a stop or a stop and a half over, I would have been struggling that much more to bring good tonal detail back in to that white shirt, or maybe you're at a wedding dealing with a white wedding dress. If I take this nice raw file and I push it up, I push it down, I quickly start losing in the background. Whereas if I do a correct balanced exposure with her skin at around zone six, right in there, I can actually just come in here and say, no, I'm just gonna go to something nice like Portra 400 and Filmus and get a nice clean balance. Then I can go further and say, I wanna darken down that background more with AI masks or with burning and dodging in Photoshop or with layers in Capture One. The shadows aren't what you need to throw away. I would much rather clip my shadows to pure black than my highlights. Highlights clipped over 255 are rarely a good thing. They'll usually print bad, they'll usually distract the eye. Shadows, if you know how to work your shadows, how to hack your shadows and where to put your subject in relation to those shadows, shadows are normally not gonna be a bad thing. In fact, I very frequently will intentionally push the shadows on my image all the way down to zero in the final edit. Not all of them, of course. I want detail overall in my shadows, but I don't worry about a little shadow clipping. I definitely worry about highlight clipping. And if you expose to the right, you're definitely going to end up with more loss of detail in highlights. What I submit to you is that we expose correctly, that we take the tools that are in our cameras, and even if that means doing spot metering like this, and really getting in there and being specific, taking an external meter, using our in-camera meters, all of these tools work. And you don't have to have meters like this because the precision of meters like the one in this X100V is actually very good now. I can also just look at the histogram if I'm doing on the go shooting and I can be metering based on the histogram. And I can visualize that directly in relation to zones on the histogram like I showed you a few minutes ago here and like we talk about more in other workshops. I want shadow, I want highlight, but I especially don't want to push the highlights too far. Expose correctly, expose right, don't expose to the right unless you very specifically have a reason that you need to do it. Don't use that as your crutch. Learn your tone, learn your exposure, learn your zones, and learn how to expose better every time. I hope you found this useful. In the end, you have to decide how to make images the way that works for you. But I hope you'll keep experimenting and trying some of these things as we learn how to hack shadows better. All right, you guys, we'll see you next time.